Carl Jung said, you are who you will become. That's you know, a famous philosopher. And I think there's, especially with entrepreneurs, we see in our mind's eye what will happen unlike anyone else. And it becomes part of who we are in a way where it's some, in some ways our identity. And it's, it's absolutely positive for the entrepreneurial side of things and maybe dangerous for our mental health if it's delayed or never happens or pivots hard without our control. Are you in the process of creating something huge and you want to understand how others have done it? Or have you already found success and still feel something is missing? Then this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Alchemist Lounge, a podcast where Alex Atwood chats with top performers to discover habits, routines, and alchemy that you can put to work in your own life. Josh Pies, it's a pleasure to have you on the show, my friend. I am happy to be here, sir. It's good to see you. Great to see you. Well, today I want to dig into, well, first of all, I want to dig into your work, your career, and learn about what a a film producer, an executive producer, somebody who really enjoys the creativity and putting an artistic vision behind what he does into a business. But first, I want to start with some information that I just learned when you filled out our pre-podcast sheet. And so you were a serial entrepreneur at the age of four. Um, (laughs) What? What's the story behind that? So... Most entrepreneurship and inventors are usually solving a problem, right? And at the age of four, my mother had a serial problem, which was she would lose her car keys. For whatever reason, I was very aware of this problem. My neighbor's mom never lost her car keys because she had this mail rack, a wooden mail rack up on the wall near their garage entrance door. And it had little hooks on there and everybody was disciplined. They put the car keys on the hooks. Well, this made sense to a four-year-old. You put the car keys at the same place every time, you won't lose your car keys. So I told my mom she should do that. And she goes, well, you make me a key rack. I was like, okay. So I went to my grandfather. And now my grandfather, he's um, a Kodak engineer. He's an industrial engineer and a chemical engineer by trade, but he, he ran a sizable department. You know, back then, you know, guys like that, they're woodworkers, they're hobbyists. He knew how to weld and do all this stuff. So I said, Grandpa, I need to make a key rack. And he goes, okay, let's do it. So we go to the hardware store. We start buying materials. We go back to the house. He's got all the tools out. And we make, we take a wooden dowel about six inches long. Right? Actually, we made it six inches long. We had to cut it. And I had to learn how to use a saw, an electric saw at four years old. And then we had to use the drill press to press the holes. And we got these little hooks to screw in. And we put two on the ends and a nice piece of string over the top. And now it was a hangable key rack. And it was my job when I went home to get a nail and a hammer and hang it up and show mom how to use her key rack. And I did. So at four years old, I made a key rack, right? Sounds unimpressive until I go, I can make more of those and sell them. Now, I said, this is a four-year-old and this was my thing. And my grandfather goes, well, then you need to become a manufacturer. And of course, he's in manufacturing and he he understands. So we go back to the store and we get multiple four foot long dowels and he teaches me how to do the math and we get all of the materials and I build, I do a manufacturing batch run of about, you know, 25, 50 of them, whatever it was. Seems like a lot to me at the time. And it, it was different times. It was 1984. I went door to door with key racks in my hand and I, I hand drew a flyer with pricing and even quantity price breakdowns. And we went to Wider's hardware store. I'll never forget this. Wider's hardware had a copy machine where it was like a penny per copy. And Mr. Wider who owned the place helped me put a dollar in to get a hundred copies out. So I had enough to go door to door. And if I couldn't meet somebody at the door, I would do a leave behind with my mom's phone number while I sold out. Well, so of course I sold out and I had, I parlayed my grandfather's, you know, $10 investment and I made over a hundred dollars. I should do this again. And by the way, I did have to pay my grandfather back. He taught me about loans, but then we went and made more. I sold hundreds, if not thousands of key racks. I made $1,600 gross, about $1,200 net when I was four. Wait, wait, wait. Is there an exaggeration happening here? No. No, those are the numbers. Okay. (laughs) Not the fiscal side of things, but a four-year-old, first of all, it's brilliant because it's really difficult to say no to a four-year-old. So that already is brilliant. I don't know that people actually needed them. I think it was, yeah. when a cute puppy shows up at your door, you feed it. Yeah. I think that's the phenomenon that occurred there. However, it was, it, it had to have been 
your grandfather that came up with that idea. And I'm sure he was standing like somewhere near you while you were knocking on those doors. Actually, back then where I lived in New York, no, a lot of kids were kind of free range. So I, I could go door to door in certain neighborhoods and it was considered completely normal and acceptable. And and also I did it at church, but I was not obviously allowed to do it in the sanctuary because that would be completely blasphemous. But I could stand outside near the cars and hawk my wares there just fine. And I did. So that was another place to find people. So, okay. So after you have this success, right, does your grandfather now start mentoring you into doing other things like this? Like what happens beyond that spark? So he, he was good. He was a very good mentor and it wasn't always entrepreneurship. I mean, I learned how to garden. I learned how to fix a car. I learned how to paint a house. I learned how to install windows. I learned how to maintain a pool, put in a new pool pump. By the time I was 12 or 13, I could do all, almost all of that on my own because he was more or less helping to raise me, you know, and, and we've talked about how crazy our, our parent lives were when we were kids, you know, our, our parents offline before. And so it makes sense that somebody would be watching me more. And that was my grandfather and my grandmother. But yeah, Grandpa Waltz did all of that for me and taught me all of those things. But I do remember my second product after that wasn't my idea, but it was we already were using dowels. And my grandmother had something with the same dowel size that was had a second dowel pressed through it that allowed us to go to a garbage disposal and push things down in the disposal without using our hands. And it, lo- it literally looked like a religious cross, but it was built in a way that it would just get to where the blades were and that that cross point would hit your sink bottom so that you wouldn't shove too far. And that way it was protecting your hands. My grandmother was absolutely convinced that if you don't have that, everybody's going to go home with just bloody knuckles. And so they thought that was my next product. And indeed it was not as good a seller, probably because I was getting older and I was less cute, but that was, you know, we were repurposing our own product. And I learned that like, Hey, if you've got wood material on hand, that's not being used, make it into something else and keep selling. And so really great lessons in manufacturing at a very young age. Yeah. Grandpa Waltz really was something else. He was. Yeah. Outstanding. Outstanding. Wow. Okay. So you're, we are an executive producer now and yeah. And that's interesting in itself. And, and, and we're going to learn a little bit more from you around what it takes to be an executive producer and what it might take to get a project produced. I'd love to hear that. But before we go there, prior to your existing career path where you are now, what were you doing before that? I'm really curious. Like, so, so now we go from four years old to maybe around college and now you're starting out like, you know, cutting your teeth. What were you doing? Sure. So... And I'll give you the short version of stories because this is one of those things where I could probably go way too long and there's too many rabbit trails to go down. But (laughs) We have um, editors. (laughs) That's true. That's fair. So in college, my my first job in college, I didn't want to work for people. I already knew that, but I didn't, it never really articulated it. So my first summer, I went and bought a truck and a trailer and figured out how to fit all the ladders on the trailer and started painting houses because it was a skill actually that my grandfather had taught me. And so I started doing physical labor over the summer because I was trying, I couldn't bear to wait tables at some reduced price. And, you know, I knew my value was higher. So I figured I'd just start a business again. And I did. And so while my friends were making two to 4,000 for a summer, I was making 10 to 20. And so that was just, past one at summer work in college. And then I sold all that stuff off and I chased an internship working for a a real estate investment trust. And boy, that that was interesting because I got the job in the affordable housing division. So, you know, affordable housing, that's code, low income housing. Mm -hmm. And I'm working in the, uh, the affordable housing division. And within the first and this is during school year at this point, within the first couple of weeks, the person who's in charge of me announces that she's pregnant and she's going out on leave, schedules her leave for way distant future. And then the doctor says, no, you need to go on bed rest, you're high risk, and this is dangerous. And so she left within like a week after hearing that. And so I had nobody to report to. Well, I happen to know the vice president of the company because of a family connection. So I went to this guy, his name's Alan. And I said, Alan, I, I don't know what to do. And he's like, what's happening? And so I explained that this person was gone. He goes, oh yeah, we haven't found a replacement yet. And he goes, wait a second. And he just gave me her job. So she was a property manager over, yeah, somewhere between three and 400 units of low-income housing property. 
And suddenly I had her job as a 21 year old kid in college going through business school. And that opened my eyes to professional real estate property management and the needs and the, of each property. And boy, do I have some wild stories because the police were doing stakeouts from some of my buildings and we had fire alarms going off all the time because of all sorts of nefarious weirdness. And I did have this cute little old lady, I forget Maria's last name, but she was 94. She only spoke Spanish and it frustrated her that I didn't speak any Spanish. So she would come with her boyfriend who was like 70 and she was robbing the cradle and uh, they would come visit me every Thursday with a Spanish omelet sandwich and she would sit down and she would point at things and then tell me a Spanish word and then she would say a sentence and make me say the sentence and so she was teaching me Spanish every Thursday that was one of my favorite things about that job actually I learned a lot in that job but little Maria and she was tiny she had to be like four foot two she was just adorable. And so I loved my Thursday morning sandwich with her. Mm-hmm. But but this is all as a college kid. So later on, and I go get my MBA and I do some stuff, you know. Where'd you get your MBA? Story, uh, technology entrepreneurship. Got it. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm, I'm wired for mm-hmm. the startup and the, the running a business and partnering with people. I don't work well for people, but I really work well with people. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. I like that equalness mm-hmm. of it. So yeah, I... During college, my car broke down, actually during my MBA. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit. I I got a lot of good lessons. Uh, It was a company called Home Properties. Amazing experience. And so then I go and I'm going to get my MBA and my car breaks down and is irreparable. And and I, I was pretty low income as a kid myself. So though I made some pretty good money now and then, it frequently went on like student loans and things. So I can't fix my car. And... I didn't really have a good plan on how to get to school at that point. And I didn't have a ton of cash built up in the moment, but I had good credit. So I problem solved and I went and bought a car that would pay for itself. What's that? It's a truck. It's a truck with a mm. plot. And I lived in a snow belt, one of the snowiest snow belts in the United States. So I figured I'm already kind of getting my homework done really fast and I can probably do my homework from a truck. I'll just go and put together a plow route and I'll just be a solopreneur for college do a couple of years of that, and then I'll sell that truck off. Well, <laughs> that didn't work because it worked too well. And I ended up within a couple of years, I ended up having 35 employees plowing over 25 million square feet of parking every time it snowed. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So See, it, it's, yeah, the entrepreneurship is in your blood, obviously. I mean, you know, that's clear to me. Wow. That is something yeah. else. That four-year-old would have been really proud of you. I think so. I well, actually, that four-year-old also would have been completely enamored with big trucks. I think <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. <laughs> you're right. And to this day, I miss getting in a wheel loader because you know a construction wheel loader, four tires, it bends in the middle, and it's got the big yeah. scooper in the front. Yeah, yeah. I, I had like ten of those, and my favorite thing in that job, other than selling, I, I had a great time selling those jobs. But jumping in a wheel loader at two in the morning with two, three, 400 horsepower pushing white stuff was Zen. It was Mm. shockingly peaceful. Yeah. I, yeah. I've heard that about mowing lawns, just being on a, it's more or less the same principle, except there's a higher probability that you'll freeze to death. Yeah, (laughs) that's true. That's true. So you have that fear of death. So it's, it's, it, it, it might add an element there. Um, It does. So let's cut over to filmmaking. So so where did you start to get interested in in filmmaking or film in general or video? So again, another phenomenally long story. You tell your editor to get ready with his razor blade. <laughs> but another thing that was happening that we haven't covered in my youth was around the time I was maybe 11 or 12, I got a really keen interest in working with our church's tech department. Now, you know, those people who aren't in modern churches right now may not be aware, but, you know, churches in the late 80s, early 90s started getting somewhat technical. Yeah. And then, of course, there's been a, a nearly exponential adoption of some pretty high tech stuff. Mm-hmm. And my mom's brother was another and it continues to be an amazing influence in my life. But he is 
a world leader in acoustical design and audio video lighting technology when it comes to design and structure and all of the stuff. There's people who turn to him from all over the world because of his ability, but he happened to be the guy who also ran the church tech department. So I was a little young, but at least I was, you know, nepotism, I got in. And so I started with the kid on the, I was the slide projector guy at 11 years old. And that's, that was my contribution. But by the time I was 12 or 13, I was starting to learn how to mix audio for live settings and big auditorium too. And fits like 1200 people. And so I was learning audio and then eventually they decided to do a TV show. And so they installed a, a full three camera system with camera control units in a back room and, you know, tape decks and all the thing. So he had to train all of his tech people on that. So by the time I was maybe, I don't know, 16, 18 years old, I was learning how to run studio cameras and the whole construct of the technology, not the art, but the technology of the industry. And then during college, I let that kind of go dormant. I was very busy. Even though I'd help out, I, I wasn't expanding my knowledge. I wasn't doing anything that said, this is your career path. So fast forward to 2006, Shannon and I are getting married. It's uh, summer of 2006, we got married. And my friend Dave was our wedding video guy. So he delivers the video later that summer and he calls Shannon. Now he would normally call me, but he calls Shannon's phone and he says, hey, Shannon, I need you to act on my TV show. Now I'm overhearing this and I'm like, Shannon, he doesn't have a TV show. And she's like, I know, this is weird. And I'm like, so I, I, we get him on speakerphone, and the long story short is he had been given the job of uh, media director for that very same church. Mm. And he looked at that very same TV show that I had helped with, and he found out nobody was watching. So he took it off the air, but he also slayed the sacred cow, and his job was instantly on the line. Huh. And so he was given an ultimatum, if you know so much, Dave, you put a better show on. So the option wasn't show or no show. It was show or better show. And so now he was on the hook. He had to have a better show and he had a couple months to do it. He liked how Shannon looked on camera for our wedding. And that was his screen test to say she was hired for his new show. (laughs) And Shannon's like, I will help Dave. But she told Dave that Josh has got to be involved. You know, we're going to do this as a couple. (laughs) Josh has got to be involved. I'm like, and, and Dave's like, yeah, you're funny. You'll do something. Sure. <laughs> what kind of decision making process was going on in the church? <laughs> I know it was fascinating, That's funny. right? Yeah. So Dave's plan, which, you know, only Dave would have this plan and only Dave could pull this off. Really? I mean, I, I love this guy. He goes, I think we're going to do Saturday Night Live, but for Christians. And I think we're going to compete with Saturday Night Live every Saturday night. And somebody tried to book on a on like the next channel up that time but couldn't book it and they booked it for the next half hour which ended up being the best thing ever because if you think about saturday night live the best sketches for the most part land in the first half hour and then it's kind of downhill yeah that's right and that's where people start surfing and if we can get them on the channel surf and give them an op- a better alternative to the worst half hour of saturday night live we got a shot at being watched so that's exactly what the media buy was and our first episodes, I still have them on DVD somewhere. I, I'm, I'll, I'll let you see them at some point. Do not let the rest of the world see them. They are terribly embarrassing. We did not know what we were doing, but we were having fun. And it ended up taking off over time as we were learning live. And that's actually something I tell a lot of my customers is, you know, a lot of the stuff that they're going to do and embark on, th- their first video is always their worst video. And I'm like, nobody has had a worst first video than me. But look at where we are. And I said, mm-hmm. so you, I always tell people, you got to try and you got to let it go live. You got to actually do it. That's a really good takeaway is it's okay to stink out loud because at some point you won't and you'll just have the joy of looking back and realizing where you were and where you've come to. So anyhow, that, that's exactly what our experience was. And, you know, it was local. It was just in our neck of the woods. And then a town over, and I say a town over, it was Rochester, New York, and then Buffalo. Somebody in the Buffalo market saw it and said, can we put it on? We're like, Sure. Then somebody was visiting the Buffalo market and said, well, I'm in charge of 15 markets. Can we put it on? And we're like, yeah. So now we're in like 17 markets. How, how many shows before you started to get? Six or six. So we weren't, I mean, we didn't have the resources to do big seasons. So we were doing like six to eight a year. Mm-hmm. And after six or six to eight episodes, it started catching on to other markets. After a couple of years, 
we ended up getting seen by Trinity Broadcasting Networks, and they had a white label called JCTV that was targeted to teens and, and young adults. And we ended up on JCTV internationally. And that was getting to the point then where somewhere in that story, I had transitioned from we closed a snow plowing business and I moved into trying my hand at video as a profession. And I remember being at a major concert series at Darien Lake. This is a, a Six Flags property at that time. And I'm behind the scenes. And it was a Christian concert series, but the biggest names on the planet were there. And somebody comes running up to me. And I kind of looked like the bassist from this really famous band, Red. And I thought they wanted my autograph because I thought they thought I was him. And so I was like, oh, no, no, no. They're on stage right now. No, no it's, I'm not the guy. And they're like, no, you're Josh from 360 TV. And my whole family watches you. We need your autograph. Wow. How did right? that feel? Boy, awesome and freaky all at the same time. <laughs> That's so cool. And it started happening for a while where we'd get recognized in restaurants. We'd get, get comped meals. It was really getting like, oh my gosh, we got some like pseudo celebrity status. And it was, it was great. It, it, we really enjoyed the ride. The show is, has it closed. Dave is actually reviving it in kind of new ways right now. And I'm enjoying seeing him regrow that. And, and because I've built a business where I, I, you know, time is crunched and I can't join him, I just cheer from him for him from the sidelines, but it, it's coming back too. It's, it's actually had a fascinating life of its own. So that was how I got into the business from, you know, young entrepreneur to college entrepreneur to oops, I own a snow plowing company to, Hey, do you want to start a TV show with no skills? Sure. And that's actually how I got in. Wow. How do you like that? <laughs> You know, that's a unique story and it's somewhat common. I met a guy by the name of Peter Golden, who was the VP of casting for all of daytime for CBS. And, and I went and had lunch with him and he started on the game show, uh, like, like doing you know game shows in the seventies, working for like a showrunner, basically going between studios and like, just bringing them, them stuff. Like we need lights here. We're missing that. And doing that and just he just showed up to work every day and learned and next thing you know he and he and he started wanting to be an actor and he decided he really loved what was going on behind the scenes so there's a lot of alchemy in sort of how that showed up for you and then oh, yeah. you, you, you know what i mean so okay so now you've taken your core skill set of or core DNA, entrepreneurial dna and you've already applied it in these really interesting ways and so at that time, you were doing well. You had 35 snow trucks, right? I mean, I don't know about whether climate change <laughs> would have had an impact at the time, but I mean, that's a, that's a big deal. And so now you're starting to catalyze this vision of being able to start a business using mm -hmm. production, video, filmmaking, right? That starts to come together, right? Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit about that. Like, like, where did that genesis take off from beyond the show? And yeah. So, well, 360 TV was the name of the show and that was going well. Nobody was making money. You know, this is through the church. It's volunteer effort, a lot of sweat equity, a lot of fun, friends for life, amazing experience. But that was our pay, you know, and well worth it. But it wasn't a career. And the snow plowing business, and, and this is for like another podcast another day, there was some tragedy that happened in that business that really forced it to close. The straw that broke the camel's back, but there were already enough things breaking its back, but the final straw was the 08-09 financial crisis that really changed a lot of just all business landscape. Mm -hmm. So, and, and as entrepreneurs frequently have, you know, that's, that's a black eye in, in the process, but it's real. And I know very few entrepreneurs that don't have some kind of a big, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I had to kind of reinvent myself. In fact, it's actually my second reinvention, something we haven't gone down, but I'll throw in there. And at some point, somebody's gonna listen to this episode and go, he is full of it. There's no way <laughs> I, I, but at the same time, I'll tell you, I promise that all, all these things are true. During my teens, I, I was a very competitive baseball player and I was getting pretty good to the point where I was getting scouted. And my vision for myself as a 16, 17, 18 year old was to go and play pro baseball. And I had enough things happen to tell me it was real, including talking to proper scouts, a division one scholarship to a college, all these things. I was a baseball player. I was going to go make millions as a baseball player. 
until my shoulder didn't hold up anymore and it was irreparable. I would never have the throwdown time I needed as a professional catcher ever again. And I had to reinvent myself and rethink who I was from like 18 to 19 years old when that happened, because my, my identity, you know, uh, Carl Jung said, you are who you will become. That's, you know, famous philosopher. And I think there's, especially with entrepreneurs, we see in our mind's eye, what will happen, unlike anyone else. And it becomes part of who we are in a way where it's some, in some ways, our identity. And it's, it's, absolutely positive for the entrepreneurial side of things and maybe dangerous for our mental health if it's delayed or never happens or pivots hard without our control. Mm. And so I had an identity crisis between 18 and 19, didn't know who I was, had to rethink everything. College, I didn't even understand what I would do in college. And yet I still had to go and figure out life. And I did. Great experience. Thank God for college. I met my wife Life would not have been what I want. I have now and what I'm completely grateful for had I gone to play baseball. So thank God I blew my shoulder. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, my, my next business, that snow plowing business crumbled very much out of my control. I had had some myopia in a couple of spots that I could, could self-diagnose, but there was a lot that was very much out of my control. And I was the, I was the young millionaire entrepreneur in my mind. And I was very proud of it and I'd worked hard for it. And I think it was okay to be a little bit proud of it, but it was all gone. And then who am I? Who am I? I didn't, I didn't even know. So I had to go through that from the age of about 27, 28 years old, whatever it was. And then my wife reminded me that we were having all this fun doing this show. And a lot of the writing was me. And a lot of the directing was me. I, as I, I carried at least maybe a third of the load of the shows and the content. There's a lot of great people doing a lot of great stuff. I can't claim ownership of any of it. But my mark was on there already. And none of us were professional. We were literally going to the library and getting books out, like how to make a video. It, it really, I mean, that's how rudimentary it was back then. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I didn't know who I was and I had to figure it out. And part of the figure it out was that my wife knew that I, I was figuring out how to be in that world of film and video and entertainment. And that's what I had to chase. And so I listened to a, you know, a good woman who knew what's up. It took me a while to get there. I thought I might go and get a steady job, something that was safe. So my idea of safe was to work towards being a cop. Hmm. <laughs> like, sure, you know, that, that job where people might have to point guns at you. Sure. Why don't you go do that safe thing? But safe income was what I was going for. And that terrible idea. I'm glad I didn't do it. So, yeah, that's why I ended up really chasing the business of what we do really hard because I was backed into it a little bit. I needed to get out of that snow plowing world. And I was told by somebody I trust, my wife, that I was getting really good at this new thing that I loved. And I did love it. I still love it. Mm. So so you like the art behind it or the production behind it or both? Oh, all of it. All All of it. So one of my favorite things is to have a big idea and bat it around. And and I'm not particularly fond of the animal cats, but I do like how they bat around things and they they hit it and back and forth and get fascinated with it. And I'm that way when it comes to an idea. I like to bat it around and it's just fun to stack things. It doesn't always have to be comedy. I I love comedy, but whatever it is, if I can build fascinating elements and some extra depth to things and just grow this this idea to something that somebody would want to watch or experience or listen to, that is so fulfilling to me that that type of storytelling, it's just addictive. Mm, um, yeah. But then I'm very clear on process. Something I'm trying to get better about in my own business, you know, just like the process of everyday stuff and systems and processes are hyper important. If you've never, you know, for the audience, if you've never listened to or read the book, The E-Myth, and you're in business, you have to do that because it really it calls you out on systems and processes. And, and I listen to it every once in a while to call myself out. And so I try to get very good about that for the overall business. But there is a process that people who are long gone at this point figured out in the film and television industry eons ago that is tried and true and it works. And, and I love the process. And, and I'll lay it out for you. It's five steps. Ready? Mm-hmm. Development, pre-production, production post-production, distribution. Development is the cat batting ideas around and trying to find funding to fund these big ideas. Pre-production is spending some of that money to put people, places, and things in order 
to eventually go into production where you film. That's lights, camera, action. Then post-production is editing, sound, special effects, all the things that make it a watchable, finished product. And then distribution, which you need to be thinking about at the point of development. And this is a failure of a lot of filmmakers. They don't think about the end. They only think about the love of the game. But if you're not programming in development for what the distribution plan is, you are now throwing caution to the wind and letting your chips fall where they may instead of owning the process and being a business person about what you're doing. So it's very dangerous to not pay attention up front to distribution. But ultimately, distribution is getting people to see your film, your production, your creation. And hopefully, in obviously the the for sale entertainment world, it's getting paid for those eyeballs. So, but it's five-step process and there's tons of micro steps within that. But if you don't know those five steps and how to work those like a boss, you shouldn't be a producer. You shouldn't be an executive producer. You probably should be one of the laborers within the process. <laughs> I like how direct you are there. So, okay. So it is a very difficult task to get financed around a creative project. And and anybody who's interested in financing a, a project can go to any one of many crowdsourcing outlets and find hundreds of, uh, at least hundreds of uh, projects that are in various stages of what Josh just described with the ultimate goal of distribution and getting people to want to pay to present your product to an audience. And so I think that's very wise. And it, it actually is, is analogous to what you do in business. You want to know who your audience is, who's going to be buying your product while you're developing it. So I, so what it, what it sounded like you were pointing at is during the development process, know who your audience is and assume that not everyone has your unique taste. So maybe taking your, your project and maybe bouncing it off some people from different, who ha have different perspectives can give you different ideas, you know, because people tend to get really tied into an artistic endeavor and put a lot of emotion yeah. around it. Yeah. So what I think is brilliant and what I think could, you could really offer to somebody listening to this, who's interested in filmmaking, but needs to sustain an actual life in the meantime, how does someone sustain the, the, the dream of filmmaking with potentially, and then, and then be able to, to, to earn an income, right? So you learn all of these tools and you have this toolbox now that you can use when you want to put a production together, cast a production, edit a production, you know, put development in place. But again, now you need to make some money in, in, in the, in the real world. So yeah. What's some advice you can give some people out there that might be interested in knowing how to make money with some of these skills? Yeah, so it's a phenomenally complicated question, you know, in the sense that you, know, you want to chase your passions. Everybody wants to just chase their passions and do something big, but you got to put food on the table. And one of the great things about our industry right now, and I think this is going forward the way it is, you know, there's a, such a high demand thanks to social media for small, medium, and large businesses to create mass quantities of content, that we all have a market opportunity to be suppliers of content on behalf of paid customers who they need to be seen. This is not your passion work. This is, and you and I have talked about it, for everything from gravy work to my whole client list to all the entrepreneurs you and I both know. All of them are candidates and probably not even candidates, shoe-ins for needing some kind of content in order to advertise. And so all of us creative filmmaker types who maybe, you know, we don't have Warner Brothers backing us for the next, you know, big idea we have, we're putting food on the table in the commercial market, helping people grow their brand, their influence in their world. And so let, let's you know, let's set up a character. A character is somebody who's making a career shift or an early move into being what I call a one-man band or a guerrilla filmmaker. They own gear, they own a good computer, they have great ideas, and they can be trusted with somebody's brand. So they're going to go out and sell to the market so that they can exchange great video productions for cash so they can eat. That's a good little business model. And one of the things that I've learned to do over the time is You've got to have a chunk of customers that are willing to exchange low fair dollars for a high quantity of outputs. And that is kind of like your baseline sustainable income. 
You got to have a lot of work happening, which also is very helpful from, uh, from a standpoint that the more work you do, the more your work will get seen and the more people trust you. So you may get referrals from people who may not have helped you buy your beach house. They may not have helped you finance your feature film, but they did help you get some food on the table, pay some rent, and they liked your work enough that they'll talk about you. So, and, and I used to be the guy who would be like, nah, I, you know, if it's under five grand, I won't even talk to you. If it's under 50 grand, you're not going to get much of my time. Because I, I got a lot of big projects and it was great. But the truth is they can't come less frequently. And they also usually include a lot more work, which puts me in front of fewer people. And so I've learned that it's better to say yes to almost everything, even if it's really small, find a way to make it happen for as many people as you can and make it happen well. Because if you can make it happen well, they're happy and they become your word of mouth chain. They're your advertising. Then as the larger projects come, you say yes to those as well. But the goal will be, if I may prescribe a goal, let's say 75% of your work is the small stuff and it's important small stuff. That other 25%, instead of waiting for it to come to you, I'm gonna challenge all you future filmmakers Go to it with ideas. And this is where you get to do weird, fun, amazing things. I remember there's this one day I went to a guy. We were already doing work for his company, big tech company. But it was maintenance work. It was good maintenance work, but it was maintenance work. And a lot of it, it was, here's how we solved this server problem for a bank. Here's how we solved this you know, security problem for this school system. Good maintenance work. And I knew they just had partnered with a big company for, this is way back when Windows 8 was moving to Windows 10, right? Yeah, I think it was, it, was it 8 to 10? Yeah, it was, it was a move from 8 to 10. And there was a software package they had partnered with to automate that. And they kept slipping and calling the old software zombie software. I was like, oh yeah, we're going to shoot a zombie movie. And we're going to make all these computers come to life, bust through tables, monitors for heads. We're going to have blood pouring out of them. We're going to have them eating people. It's going to be psycho. And I brought that to him and the multi-billion dollar CEO of the other company. And they couldn't, like, they just sat there, like, faces white. I'm like, oh, I'm losing them. This is terrible. A couple days later, I get, we're doing it. That was the text I got. We're doing it. And I sent back, how much? Question mark. Six figures. And there's more to that story, and, and you'll never see that video for some really wild reasons. But the, the lesson in that was I pitched a big idea knowing that if I didn't land that work, I at least had their trust that we were doing the good maintenance stuff. And they could just chalk it up to Josh was having a bad day, and he shouldn't have pitched it. That was pretty low risk because I already had their trust. But it was worth it because I wanted to flex my creative muscles, and I'm pretty confident I could flex my creative muscles on their behalf in a wild way. And I had a pretty dialed-in pitch. And I got a yes with money. And I don't think enough filmmakers actually do that, where they know they know where the bread's buttered and they honor the heck out of it. But they also know where the relationships are, where they can pitch bigger ideas. And, and I know a lot of filmmakers want to go and do a movie that is sans branding. They don't want to do a feature film that's product placed a hundred times. They don't want to do a big brand piece for a business and then stick their little story inside of it. You know, they feel like that's almost pejorative to their creativity. But what I would say is baby steps and sometimes giant steps still don't get you maybe to your end goal, but they get you a lot closer. Mm -hmm. And if I ever wanted to do a feature, which I've worked on a whole bunch of features, we can talk about that, produced a number of features, we can talk about that. But if I ever want my directorial stamp on my own feature and get my own investors to throw money at my passion project that is all straight entertainment, boy, I better have some pretty awesome samples of what I can do. And what better than having it completely paid for by some big brands. And so to me, do that small stuff, honor that small stuff, be proud of it. Small business is the backbone of America. So helping the uh, the small businesses of our country is a good thing. As long as you're getting paid doing it, it's super cool. And then as you start getting that base, don't hesitate to go and go hunt the bigger ones, create the bigger ones, open that opportunity yourself. You're creative. So do it. Great advice. Yeah. Just get started. Yeah. Whatever it is, just get started. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, it's uh, John Maxwell often says, 
I either win or I learn. And I love that because there is no fail in his world because every failure is just a plethora of opportunity to understand what happened and learn from it and grow from it. So I either win or I learn. And, you know, in Yoda, the great Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. So I think Nike had it right with just do it. Yoda had it right. John Maxwell has it probably nailed perfectly. And I think that's kind of my maxim is like, I'm going to, I'm going to give this a go and we're going to see what happens. Mm. And one way or another, I'm going to be better for it. Amazing. Wow. Well, this was incredible advice. Very pragmatic. You took the mystery out of film production to a great degree. We could go on and on and on about how video and production has changed, how Mm -hmm. technology has just completely upended the game, how there are so many opportunities out there in online marketplaces where really talented producers or production people or crew can now make a, you know, make a living in markets that aren't necessarily on both coasts that we've talked about. So we have a ton to talk about, but thank you for sharing so much of this wisdom and, you know, whether or not we edit some of it, I don't know, but I'm going to make sure the good pieces stay in my friend. And this is a long time coming. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming on the show. If anybody's interested in working with Josh, learning more about how to produce or having him work on one of your projects, please click on the link if you're watching this on YouTube. And again, thanks so much for coming, Josh. My pleasure, man. Thanks for listening in to the Alchemist Lounge. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review on Apple iTunes. To catch all the latest from Alex Atwood, you can check out his website at alexatwood.co. Thanks again, and we'll catch you next time at the Alchemist Lounge.